Between the Lights by E. F. Benson This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rafe Ball Between the Lights by E. F. Benson The day had been one unceasing fall of snow, from sunrise until the gradual withdrawal of the vague white light outside indicated that the sun had set again. But, as usual at this hospitable and delightful house of Everard Chandler, where I often spent Christmas and was spending it now, there had been no lack of entertainment, and the hours had passed with a rapidity that had surprised us. A short billiard tournament had filled up the time between breakfast and lunch, with badminton and the morning papers for those who were temporarily not engaged, while afterwards the interval till tea-time had been occupied by the majority of the party in a huge game of hide-and-seek all over the house, barring the billiard-room, which was sanctuary for any who desired peace. But few had done that. The enchantment of Christmas, I must suppose, had, like some spell, made children of us again, and it was with palsied terror and trembling misgivings that we had tiptoed up and down the dim passages, from any corner of which some wild screaming form might dart out on us. Then, wearied with exercise and emotion, we had assembled again for tea in the hall, a room of shadows and panels on which the light from the wide-open fireplace, where there burned a divine mixture of peat and logs, flickered and grew bright again on the walls. Then, as was proper, ghost stories, for the narration of which the electric light was put out, so that the listeners might conjecture anything they pleased to be lurking in the corners, succeeded, and we vied with each other in blood, bones, skeletons, armour and shrieks. I had just given my contribution, and was reflecting with some complacency that probably the worst was now known when Everard, who had not yet administered to the horror of his guests, spoke. He was sitting opposite me in the full blaze of the fire, looking, after the illness he had gone through during the autumn, still rather pale and delicate. All the same, he had been among the boldest and best in the exploration of dark places that afternoon, and the look on his face now rather startled me. No. I don't mind that sort of thing, he said. The paraphernalia of ghosts has become somehow rather hackneyed, and when I hear of screams and skeletons, I feel I am on familiar ground and can at least hide my head under the bedclothes. Ah, but the bedclothes were twitched away by my skeleton, said I, in self-defence. I know, but I don't even mind that. Why, there are seven... Eight skeletons in this room now, covered with blood and skin and other horrors. No, the nightmares of one's childhood were the really frightening things, because they were vague. There was the true atmosphere of horror about them, because one didn't know what one feared. Now, if one could recapture that... Mrs. Chandler got quickly out of her seat. Oh, Everard, she said... "'Surely you don't wish to recapture it again. "'I should have thought once was enough.' "'This was enchanting. "'A chorus of invitation asked him to proceed. "'The real true ghost story first-hand, "'which was what seemed to be indicated, "'was too precious a thing to lose.' "'Everard laughed. "'No, dear, I don't want to recapture it again at all,' "'he said to his wife. "'Then to us,' but really the, well, the nightmare, perhaps, to which I was referring, is of the vaguest and most unsatisfactory kind. It has no apparatus about it at all. You will probably all say that it was nothing, and wonder why I was frightened. But I was. It frightened me out of my wits. And I only just saw something, without being able to swear what it was, and heard something, which might have been a falling stone. Anyhow, tell us about the falling stone, said I. 
There was a stir of movement about the circle round the fire, and the movement was not of purely physical order. It was as if, this is only what I personally felt, it was as if the childish gaiety of the hours we had passed that day was suddenly withdrawn. We had jested on certain subjects. We had played hide-and-seek with all the power of earnestness that was in us. But now, so it seemed to me, there was going to be real hide-and-seek. Real terrors were going to lurk in dark corners, or if not real terrors, terrors so convincing as to assume the garb of reality were going to pounce on us. And Mrs. Chandler's exclamation as she sat down again, Oh, Everard, won't it excite you? Tended in any case to excite us. The room still remained in dubious darkness, except for the sudden lights disclosed on the walls by the leaping flames on the hearth, and there was wide field for conjecture as to what might lurk in the dim corners. Everard, moreover, who had been sitting in bright light before, was banished by the extinction of some flaming log into the shadows. A voice alone spoke to us as he sat back in his low chair, a voice rather slow, but very distinct. Last year, he said, on the 24th of December, we were down here, as usual, Amy and I, for Christmas. Several of you who are here now were here then, three or four of you at least. I was one of these, but like the others, kept silence, for the identification, so it seemed to me, was not asked for. And he went on again without a pause. Those of you who were here then, he said, and are here now, will remember how very warm it was this day last year. You will remember, too, that we played croquet that day on the lawn. It was perhaps a little cold for croquet, and we played it rather in order to be able to say, with sound evidence to back the statement, that we had done so. Then he turned and addressed the whole little circle. We played ties of half games, he said, just as we have played billiards today, and it was certainly as warm on the lawn then as it was in the billiard room this morning directly after breakfast, while today I should not wonder if there was three feet of snow outside. More, probably. Listen. A sudden draught fluted in the chimney, and the fire flared up as the current of air caught it. The wind also drove the snow against the windows, and, as he said, listen, we heard a soft scurry of the falling flakes against the panes, like the soft tread of many little people who stepped lightly, but with the presence of multitudes who were flocking to some rendezvous. Hundreds of little feet seemed to be gathering outside. Only the glass kept them out. And of the eight skeletons present, four or five, anyhow, turned and looked at the windows. These were small paned with leaden bars. On the leaden bars, little heaps of snow had accumulated, but there was nothing else to be seen. Yes, last Christmas Eve was very warm and sunny, went on Everard. We had no frost that autumn, and a tremorarius dahlia was still in flower. I've always thought that it must have been mad. He paused a moment. And I wonder if I were not mad too, he added. No one interrupted him. There was something arresting, I must suppose, in what he was saying. It chimed in anyhow with the hide-and-seek, with the suggestions of the lonely snow. Mrs. Chandler had sat down again, but I heard her stir in her chair. But never was there a gay party so reduced as we had been in the last five minutes. Instead of laughing at ourselves for playing silly games, we were all taking a serious game seriously. Anyhow, I was sitting out, he said to me, while you and my wife played your half-game of croquet. Then it struck me that it was not so warm as I had supposed, because quite suddenly I shivered, and shivering I looked up. But I did not see you and her playing croquet at all. I saw something which had no relation to you and her. At least, I hope not. Now the angler lands his fish, the stalker kills his stag, and the speaker holds his audience. And as the fish is gaffed, and as the stag is shot, so were we held. 
there was no getting away till he had finished with us. You all know the croquet lawn, he said, and how it is bounded all round by a flower border with a brick wall behind it, through which, you will remember, there is only one gate. Well, I looked up and saw that the lawn, I could for one moment see it was still a lawn, was shrinking, and the walls closing in upon it. As they closed in too, they grew higher, and simultaneously the light began to fade and be sucked from the sky, till it grew quite dark overhead, and only a glimmer of light came in through the gate. There was, as I told you, a dahlia in flower that day, and as this dreadful darkness and bewilderment came over me, I remember that my eyes sought it in a kind of despair, holding on, as it were, to any familiar object. But it was no longer a dahlia, and for the red of its petals I saw only the red of some feeble firelight, and at that moment the hallucination was complete. I was no longer sitting on the lawn watching croquet, but I was in a low-roofed room, something like a cattle shed, but round. Close above my head, though I was sitting down, ran rafters from wall to wall. It was nearly dark, but a little light came in from the door opposite to me, which seemed to lead into a passage that communicated with the exterior of the place. Little, however, of the wholesome air came into this dreadful den. The atmosphere was oppressive and foul beyond all telling. It was as if for years it had been the place of some human menagerie, and for those years had been uncleaned and unsweetened by the winds of heaven. Yet that oppressiveness was nothing to the awful horror of the place from the view of the spirit. Some dreadful atmosphere of crime and abomination dwelt heavy in it. Its denizens, whoever they were, were scarce human, so it seemed to me, and though men and women were akin more to the beasts of the field. And in addition, there was present to me some sense of the weight of years. I had been taken and thrust down into some epoch of dim antiquity. He paused a moment, and the fire on the hearth leaped up for a second, and then died down again. But in that gleam I saw that all faces were turned to Everard, and that all wore some look of dreadful expectancy. Certainly I felt it myself, and waited in a sort of shrinking horror for what was coming. As I told you, he continued, where there had been that unseasonable dahlia, there now burned a dim firelight, and my eyes were drawn there. Shapes were gathered round it. What they were, I could not at first see. Then, perhaps my eyes got more accustomed to the dusk, or the fire burned better, for I perceived that they were of human form, but very small, for when one rose with a horrible chattering to his feet, his head was still some inches off the low roof. He was dressed in a sort of shirt that came to his knees, but his arms were bare and covered with hair. Then the gesticulation and chattering increased, and I knew that they were talking about me, for they kept pointing in my direction. At that my horror suddenly deepened, for I became aware that I was powerless and could not move hand or foot. A helpless, nightmare impotence had possession of me. I could not lift a finger or turn my head, and in the paralysis of that fear I tried to scream, but not a sound could I utter. All this, I suppose, took place with the instantaneousness of a dream, for at once, and without transition, the whole thing had vanished, and I was back on the lawn again, while the stroke for which my wife was aiming was still unplayed. But my face was dripping with perspiration, and I was trembling all over. Now, you may all say that I had fallen asleep and had a sudden nightmare. That may be so, but I was conscious of no sense of sleepiness before, and I was conscious of none afterwards. It was as if someone had held a book before me, 
whisked the pages open for a second and closed them again. Somebody, I don't know who, got up from his chair with a sudden movement that made me start and turned on the electric light. I do not mind confessing that I was rather glad of this. Everard laughed. Really, I feel like Hamlet in the play scene, he said, and as if there was a guilty uncle present. Shall I go on? I don't think anyone replied, and he went on. Well, let us say for the moment that it was not a dream exactly, but a hallucination. Whichever it was, in any case, it haunted me. For months, I think, it was never quite out of my mind, but lingered somewhere in the dusk of consciousness, sometimes sleeping quietly, so to speak, but sometimes stirring in its sleep. It was no good my telling myself that I was disquieting myself in vain, for it was as if something had actually entered into my very soul, as if some seed of horror had been planted there. And as the weeks went on, the seed began to sprout, so that I could no longer even tell myself that the vision had been a moment's disorderment only. I can't say that it actually affected my health. I did not, as far as I know, sleep or eat insufficiently. But morning after morning, I used to wake, not gradually and through pleasant dozings into full consciousness, but with absolute suddenness, and find myself plunged into an abyss of despair. Often, too, eating or drinking, I used to pause and wonder if it was worthwhile. Eventually, I told two people about my trouble, hoping that perhaps the mere communication would help matters, hoping also, but very distantly, that though I could not believe at present that digestion or the obscurities of the nervous system were at fault, a doctor, by some simple dose, might convince me of it. In other words, I told my wife, who laughed at me, and my doctor, who laughed also, and assured me that my health was quite unnecessarily robust. At the same time, he suggested that change of air and scene does wonders for the delusions that exist merely in the imagination. He also told me, in answer to a direct question, that he would stake his reputation on the certainty that I was not going mad. Well, we went up to London as usual for the season, and though nothing whatever occurred to remind me in any way of that single moment on Christmas Eve, the reminding was seen to all right, the moment itself took care of that, for instead of fading as is the way of sleeping or waking dreams, it grew every day more vivid, and ate, so to speak, like some corrosive acid into my mind, etching itself there. And to London succeeded Scotland. I took last year, for the first time, a small forest up in Sutherland, called Glen Callan, very remote and wild, but affording excellent stalking. It was not far from the sea, and the gillies used always to warn me to carry a compass on the hill, because sea mists were liable to come up with frightful rapidity, and there was always a danger of being caught by one, and of having perhaps to wait hours till it cleared again. This, at first, I always used to do, but, as everyone knows, any precaution that one takes which continues to be unjustified gets gradually relaxed, and, at the end of a few weeks, since the weather had been uniformly clear, it was natural that, as often as not, my compass remained at home. One day, the stalk took me on to a part of my ground that I had seldom been on before, a very high tableland on the limit of my forest, which went down very steeply on one side to a loch that lay below it, and on the other, by gentler gradations, to the river that came from the loch, six miles below which stood the lodge. The wind had necessitated our climbing up, or so my stalker had insisted, not by the easier way, but up the crags from the lock. I had argued the point with him, for it seemed to me that it was impossible that the deer could get our scent if we went by the more natural path. But he still held to his opinion, and therefore, since after all this was part of his job, I yielded. A dreadful climb we had of it, 
over big boulders with deep holes in between, masked by clumps of heather, so that a wary eye and a prodding stick were necessary for each step if one wished to avoid broken bones. Adders also literally swarmed in the heather. We must have seen a dozen at least on our way up, and adders are a beast for which I have no manner of use. But a couple of hours saw us to the top, only to find that the stalker had been utterly at fault, and that the deer must quite infallibly have got wind of us if they had remained in the place where we last saw them. That, when we could spy the ground again, we saw had happened. In any case, they had gone. The man insisted the wind had changed, a palpably stupid excuse, and I wondered at that moment what other reason he had, for reason I felt sure there must be, for not wishing to take what would clearly now have been a better route. But this piece of bad management did not spoil our luck, for within an hour we spied more deer, and about two o'clock I got a shot, killing a heavy stag. Then, sitting on the heather, I ate lunch, and enjoyed a well-earned bask and smoke in the sun. The pony, meantime, had been saddled with the stag, and was plodding homewards. The morning had been extraordinarily warm, with a little wind blowing off the sea, which lay a few miles off, sparkling beneath a blue haze, and all morning, in spite of our abominable climb, I had had an extreme sense of peace, so much so that several times I had probed my mind, so to speak, to find if the horror still lingered there, but I could scarcely get any response from it. Never since Christmas had I been so free of fear, and it was with a great sense of repose, both physical and spiritual, that I lay looking up into the blue sky, watching my smoke whirls curl slowly away into nothingness. But I was not allowed to take my ease long, for Sandy came and begged that I would move. The weather had changed, he said, the wind had shifted again, and he wanted me to be off this high ground and onto the path again as soon as possible, because it looked to him as if a sea mist would presently come up. And yon's a bad place to get down in the mist, he added, nodding towards the crags we had come up. I looked at the man in amazement, for to our right lay a gentle slope down onto the river, and there was now no possible reason for again tackling those hideous rocks up which we had climbed this morning. More than ever I was sure he had some secret reason for not wishing to go the obvious way. But about one thing he was certainly right. The mist was coming up from the sea, and I felt in my pocket for the compass, and found I had forgotten to bring it. Then there followed a curious scene which lost us time that we could really ill afford to waste. I insisting on going down by the way that common sense directed, he imploring me to take his word for it that the crags were the better way. Eventually, I marched off to the easier descent and told him not to argue any more but follow. What annoyed me about him was that he would only give the most senseless reasons for preferring the crags. There were mossy places, he said, on the way I wished to go, a thing patently false, since the summer had been one spell of unbroken weather, or it was longer, also obviously untrue, or that there were so many vipers about. But seeing that none of these arguments produced any effect, at last he desisted and came after me in silence. We were not yet half down when the mist was upon us, shooting up from the valley like the broken water of a wave, and in three minutes we were enveloped in a cloud of fog so thick that we could barely see a dozen yards in front of us. It was therefore another cause for self-congratulation that we were not now, as we should otherwise have been, precariously clambering on the face of those crags up which we had come with such difficulty in the morning, and as I rather prided myself on my powers of generalship in the matter of direction, I continued leading, feeling sure that before long we should strike the track by the river. More than all, the absolute freedom from fear elated me. Since Christmas I had not known the instinctive joy of that. I felt like a schoolboy home for the holidays. But the mist grew thicker and thicker, and whether it was that real rain clouds had formed above it, 
or that it was of an extraordinary density itself, I got wetter in the next hour than I have ever been before or since. The wet seemed to penetrate the skin and chill the very bones, and still there was no sign of the track for which I was making. Behind me, muttering to himself, followed the stalker, but his arguments and protestations were dumb, and it seemed as if he kept close to me, as if afraid. Now, there are many unpleasant companions in this world. I would not, for instance, care to be on the hill with a drunkard or a maniac, but worse than either, I think, is a frightened man, because his trouble is infectious, and, insensibly, I began to be afraid of being frightened too. From that, it is but a short step to fear. Other perplexities too beset us. At one time we seemed to be walking on flat ground, at another I felt sure we were climbing again, whereas all the time we ought to have been descending, unless we had missed the way very badly indeed. Also, for the month was October, it was beginning to get dark, and it was with a sense of relief that I remembered that the full moon would rise soon after sunset. But it had grown very much colder, and soon, instead of rain, we found we were walking through a steady fall of snow. Things were pretty bad, but then for the moment they seemed to mend, for, far away to the left, I suddenly heard the brawling of the river. It should, it is true, have been straight in front of me, and we were perhaps a mile out of our way. But this was better than the blind wandering of the last hour, and turning to the left I walked towards it. But before I had gone a hundred yards I heard a sudden choked cry behind me, and just saw Sandy's form flying, as if in terror of pursuit, into the mists. I called to him, but got no reply, and heard only the spurned stones of his running. What had frightened him I had no idea, but certainly with his disappearance the infection of his fear disappeared also, and I went on, I may almost say, with gaiety. On the moment, however, I saw a sudden well-defined blackness in front of me, and before I knew what I was doing I was half stumbling, half walking up a very steep grass slope. During the last few minutes the wind had got up, and the driving snow was peculiarly uncomfortable, but there had been a certain consolation in thinking that the wind would soon disperse these mists, and I had nothing more than a moonlight walk home. But, as I paused on this slope, I became aware of two things. One, that the blackness in front of me was very close. The other, that, whatever it was, it sheltered me from the snow. So I climbed on a dozen yards into its friendly shelter, for it seemed to me to be friendly. A wall some twelve feet high crowned the slope, and exactly where I struck it there was a hole in it, or door rather, through which a little light appeared. Wondering at this I pushed on, bending down, for the passage was very low, and in a dozen yards came out on the other side. Just as I did this the sky suddenly grew lighter, the wind I suppose having dispersed the mists, and the moon, though not yet visible through the flying skirts of cloud, made sufficient illumination. I was in a circular enclosure, and above me there projected from the walls some four feet from the ground broken stones which must have been intended to support a floor. Then, simultaneously, two things occurred. The whole of my nine months' terror came back to me, for I saw that the vision in the garden was fulfilled, and at the same moment I saw stealing towards me a little figure as of a man, but only about three foot six in height. That my eyes told me. My ears told me that he stumbled on a stone. My nostrils told me that the air I breathed was of an overpowering foulness, and my soul told me that it was sick unto death. I think I tried to scream, but could not. I know I tried to move, and could not. And it crept closer. Then, I suppose the terror which held me spellbound so spurred me that I must move, for next moment I heard a cry break from my lips and was stumbling through the passage. 
I made one leap of it down the grass slope and ran as I hoped never to have to run again. What direction I took, I did not pause to consider, so long as I put distance between me and that place. Luck, however, favoured me, and before long I struck the track by the river and an hour afterwards reached the lodge. Next day I developed a chill, and as you know, pneumonia laid me on my back for six weeks. Well, that is my story. And there are many explanations. You may say that I fell asleep on the lawn, and was reminded of that by finding myself, under discouraging circumstances, in an old Pict's castle, where a sheep or a goat that, like myself, had taken shelter from the storm was moving about. Yes, there are hundreds of ways in which you may explain it, but the coincidence was an odd one, and those who believe in second sight might find an instance of their hobby in it. And that is all? I asked. Yes, it was nearly too much for me. I think the dressing bell has sounded. End of Between the Lights Recording by Rafe Ball